Hello, everyone, and welcome to another session of the Rosalind Franklin Society Annual Meeting. I'm Juliana Lemire, Deputy Editor-in-Chief at GEN, and I'll be your host for this session on Why Sex Matters in Health and Disease. The session will focus on the genetic differences between males and females and the biological and medical ramifications of these differences. It's hard to imagine a topic more germane to the focus of this meeting, honestly. To dig into this topic, we're joined by Dr. David Page. David is a professor of biology at MIT and the Whitehead Institute. He started his training in David Botstein's lab at MIT and then became the first ever Whitehead Fellow. After being awarded a MacArthur Genius Grant, he was promoted to the faculty at MIT where he's been ever since. David also served as director of the Whitehead Institute from 2004 to 2020. And in addition, we should mention, he's been an HHMI investigator since 1990. David led the team that sequenced the Y chromosome 20 years ago in 2003. And since then, his lab has been investigating the contributions of the X and Y chromosomes to sex differences at the genomic, epigenetic, molecular, and cellular levels. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about all of this research. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Juliana. It's, um, it's a real privilege and honor, real delight to um, be able to join with the Rosalind Thank, uh, Franklin Society today. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. And I'm going to um, go to a screen share here and see. I'd like today to dedicate my comments to an individual who was born five years after Rosalind Franklin also in the UK, who is a great hero of mine, and that is Mary Lyon. Um, my comments today are built upon Mary's 1961 proposal. I think it was Nobel worthy. Uh, her 1961 proposal that one of the two X chromosomes in female cells is silenced by a process that we know as X chromosome inactivation the term that Mary introduced, uh, it's also known as lionization in honor of Mary. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to do today is discuss with you the question of the origins of biological sex differences in health and disease, of differences between females and males, differences that are not due to environmental or social cues, but that we suspect are biologically hardwired. So the first question is, what do I mean by sex differences? <clears throat> well, in the reproductive tract, where sex differences have most traditionally been studied, and, and to be honest, where I spent uh, many of the early years of my career, in the reproductive tract, many sex differences are binary. And I put forward here egg and sperm as an extreme example of the binaries that characterize reproduction and the reproductive tract. But outside the reproductive tract and across the body, um, sex differences are not binary and they instead tend to involve continuous traits. And one of my favorite examples is shown here. This is a, uh, an image that was taken more than um, a decade ago, uh, more than a century ago on the, uh, on the American football pitch at what is now the University of Connecticut was then the Connecticut State Agricultural College. And this iconic image is often shown in textbooks and lectures on quantitative genetics. And here you see the students at the Connecticut State Agricultural College arranged by their heights um, in feet and inches from uh, 410 on the left to 62 at the right. And you might notice that all of the uh, students are dressed in their black uniforms. And you might notice that there's a group of individuals who are missing from this picture. Uh, <clears throat> this was uh, such an iconic image. The scene was recreated um, <clears throat> uh, almost uh, <clears throat> uh, 80, 90 years later on the same football pitch but now there are students dressed in black t-shirts and they're joined by students in white t-shirts. And you see the distributions of heights 
um, actually, and and you'll see that the the four ten sign is uh, four feet ten sign is still represented for historical purposes, but uh, and you may notice that the distribution of heights in the individuals dressed in black has shifted a few inches to the right over that time. Um, and, uh, and of course, the, you see the, the amazingly overlapping but shifted distribution, leftward shifted distribution of the heights of the individuals uh, dressed in, in white um, uh, uh, sweatshirts. So <clears throat> here we see the, the most intensely studied trait in all of genetics, that is human height, and this remarkable um, um, five inch or 13 centimeter shift between the peaks of the distributions between the biological males and the biological females. So that's a, a healthy trait in which we see um, uh, sex differences of a continuous nature, um, overlapping distributions, but shifted, but shifted distributions. And diseases display sex differences. Actually, across all of medicine, one can see striking differences in the incidence or severity or progression of disease between males and females. I'll just show you a few examples. So let's take the case of rheumatoid arthritis. For every male who's affected with rheumatoid arthritis, there are um, about two or three females who are uh, similarly affected. Let's uh, flip the switch. Let's flip the tables and talk about autism spectrum disorder, which is for every young female in whom this diagnosis is made, there are about four or five males in whom the diagnosis is made. Let's flip it again and go to lupus. This severe autoimmune dis disease uh, for every male who's affected there are about six females affected. Um, and responses to medicines differed, can differ dramatically between males and females. I'm just going to show you one example that played out just within the last four or five years, um, to which relatively little attention has been paid as an example of uh, sex differences, but I think you, you, might, you might find it to be an interesting one. It turns out that heart failure, um, an extraordinarily common uh, disorder in our, in our species, uh, heart failure can take different forms in males and females. And it turns out that one of the most common forms of heart failure in women is, is so-called with preserved ejection fraction. And it turned out there was not, a, there was not available uh, very effective treatment regimens, medical treatment regimens for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which again is more common in females than males. <clears throat> well, in this study that was published now just four and a half years ago of a uh, potential new therapeutic regimen, the conclusion was drawn that this uh, dual therapy did not result in a significantly lower rate of hospitalization or death from cardiovascular uh, causes. <clears throat> However, when you looked in detail at the results, something very interesting showed up, and that was that the actual rate of um, hospitalization and of death from cardiovascular causes. If you look in detail at the bottom here, you'll see that the females in the study actually showed um, a 27% reduction in um, hospitalizations and death from cardiovascular causes. It was only when you lumped the data, when you failed to split out the males and females, was there no significant improvement. Um, and uh, it was interesting to read the editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine that commented on this unanticipated um, distinction between the biologies of males and females in the face of this um, treatment regimen. Here's what the editorial had to say. 
the finding of a suggested benefit with the dual treatment in women was unexpected. And then goes on to speculate what the possible cause might be. Women have smaller hearts than men, and perhaps the dose of medication was pharmacologically higher. Well, if I had a nickel for every time I've been uh, told that, that females are basically small males, um, I'd, I'd be a very wealthy person. Um, but also, uh, you know, with all seriousness, it, it's, it was interesting that this was the first hypothesis that jumped to mind on the part of the editorial writers here. Um, suffice to say that actually a few years later, this, um, this treatment is now um, on the market specifically for the treatment of women with, pres uh, with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. <clears throat> and if we ask the question of should we have anticipated, should the, des the, ex the uh, designers of that heart failure study, should they have anticipated that there might be differences between males and females in their response to that therapy? It turns out that across almost every form of heart disease, which I'll remind you is the number one killer, but just barely ahead of cancer, but the number one um, a cause of mortality in, in Western populations, almost every form of heart disease, and there are many flavors, show profound differences between males and females. And I'll just show you one example here that comes uh, from the work of my good friends, John and Cricket Seidman here in Boston, um, experts in the genetic basis of the cardiomyopathies. Here is a survival or death curve, if you will, for um, <clears throat> females who carry the genetic predisposition to dilated cardiomyopathy, where the heart wall thins and balloons dangerously due to a defect in the sarcomere, in the contractile unit of the cardiomyocyte. And it turns out that similarly, um, uh, it turns out that males with equivalent genetic defects, perfectly equivalent genetic defects, males tend to die um, about 10 years earlier. And in fact, it was the, it was hearing um, John Seidman talk about this particular male-female difference that drew my attention and hooked me into moving beyond the reproductive tract and thinking about sex differences across the body. So in fact, we've known that male and female hearts, and I would argue that almost all organs are subtly but importantly different um, in ways that play out in disease uh, of all sorts. So the question then for me as a basic scientist is what are the origins of these biological sex differences, these differences between females and males in health and disease? Where do they come from? Well, the, uh, when I ask my colleagues in academic medicine, what is the cause, uh, what, what is the source of these sex differences in one or another disease that show profound uh, male, male or female biases? The answer I almost always get is, I don't have a clue. If I press harder and ask my colleagues in academic medicine, they'll say, well, maybe it's sex hormones. But <clears throat> the reality is that in almost all cases of these sex biases and disease across the body, we don't know the answer. And I want to I want to take a minute and say why do I find this scientific question so appealing, and not just because I think it's terribly terribly important, but it, I must admit it has a deep appeal for me, um, <clears throat> sort of um, as a as a focus of my uh, of my professional efforts, and the question what the question to me is so appealing to me in part because it resists conventional scientific framings. We were all taught as scientists to be reductionists, to, to frame experimental propositions, to frame scientific propositions where one variable changes at a time so that we can do controls, 
and experiment, con compare controls and experimentals that differ by one variable. The problem is that sex differences are completely resistant to this reductionist framing. And that is because sex changes everything. Males and females differ by their anatomy, by their physiology, by their hormonal status, and as, uh, <clears throat> well, as I'll talk about in a minute, by their sex chromosomes. And all of these variables change all at once. And if you insist that you change only one at a time, you will be sorely disappointed because that is not, that is not an available or accessible question. Therefore, because it doesn't appear to be um, these questions, because they don't appear to be uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, reducible to single variables, they are for many scientists the, a set of questions that are invisible in plain sight. And that is for me deeply appealing. And I believe that the answers when we, when we reach them will transform healthcare for all. And as it turns out, I had the opportunity um, to get started in this direction in a research project that I began the summer after my very first year of medical school. Um, <clears throat> I had the privilege and um, the lucky distinction to become, to be the first student anywhere in the world to work on what would become the Human Genome Project. And then um, as Juliana mentioned, I had a chance a few years later to establish um, an independent laboratory as, for, as the first Whitehead Fellow at the Whitehead Institute. And I just thought I would show you a photo um, from my earliest years at uh, Whitehead Institute. And uh, this is a picture from the 1980s. I am standing next to my colleague, Laura Brown. Um, <clears throat> who was my, uh, the first person to join me in my lab. And I'm happy to say uh, 40 years later uh, remains my lab manager. Um, and in fact, Laura helped me assemble these slides for this presentation to you today. Um, so what I had the chance, to, what Laura and I had the chance to begin studying um, many years ago at the dawn of the Human Genome Project we happened to stumble onto um, what would become my very, very favorite pair of chromosomes. And so I want to invite you over the next few minutes um, to join me in thinking about this, uh, what is for me my very favorite pair of chromosomes. So on the left, stately and statuesque is the X chromosome. And to its right, with its head down is the demure and diminutive Y chromosome. To be honest, I've spent most of my career defending the honor of that little Y chromosome in the face of innumerable insults to its character and future prospects. And so, to be honest, I have no right taking the stage at the Rosalind uh, Franklin Society's annual meeting because I've spent so much time studying the Y. But as I, as I will try to explain briefly over the next couple of minutes, my new obsession is actually the X chromosome and specifically the inactivated X chromosome that Mary Lyon um, told us about in 1961. And I'm going to argue over the next few minutes that the X chromosome and especially the inactive X chromosome today is as misunderstood as the Y chromosome ever was. And so let's start correcting that misunderstanding of the X chromosome right here, right now. So the members of our species are said to have sex chromosomes of two kinds. Now, while that's true in conventional genetic parlance, epigenetically speaking, Human somatic cells have sex chromosomes of three kinds. These are the XA, what I'll call XA for short. This is the so-called active X chromosome, XI, the so-called inactive X. And you may remember learning about the bar body, which is another name for the inactive X and the Y chromosome. So these three epigenetically distinct kinds of sex chromosomes can coexist 
in the same somatic cell in various combinations. And I'll just, uh, to see uh, <laughs> how you're following along, I'll just offer to you a, um, a pop quiz. What is the name of a syndrome where an individual's cells have one XA plus one XI plus one Y? I'll just give you a moment to think about that. The answer is Kleinfelder syndrome, one XA, one XI, one Y. But typically, typically human somatic cells come in these two varieties, one XA plus one XI or one XA plus one Y. The point is that one XA is present in somatic cells of both sexes. <clears throat> and in the last um, half a dozen years, after extensive epigenetic characterization, my colleagues and I um, have looked for, but can find no epigenetic differences between the XAs in female and male cells, which is to say that the XAs appear to be epigenetically uniform, the same in females and males. <clears throat> and so the XA is not female. And I will point out here, the person who has really led and championed these studies in our lab, and that is um, uh, Adriana San Roman, who very happily this week launches her own lab at Duke University. <clears throat> so it turns out then that the chromosomes that differ between the sexes are XI versus Y. <clears throat> we have traditionally said that females are XX and males XY, but now one could say that females are XI and males are Y. But wouldn't this just be semantics? Isn't XI genetically inactive? And isn't the Y chromosome of no importance outside the testes? Well, indeed, the old understanding, the old understanding, um, <clears throat> uh, which is to say what's taught in most universities and medical schools today, the old understanding is that the Y chromosome functions only in testes and that in female cells, the second X chromosome, the XI is silent, transcriptionally silent. And combining these ideas, you'll recognize that outside the gonads then, that XX and XY cells would be functionally equivalent. Outside the gonads, if these ideas were both true, then both XX and XY would be functionally XO. But these are outdated models. So I'll quickly summarize 30 years of work by many labs, including my own, in building a very different model. What we know today is that there are 10 different genes on the Y chromosome that are actually expressed in virtually all cell types throughout the body. And these regulate the expression of thousands of other genes. <clears throat> these are very special global regulator genes that are retained on the Y chromosome. And there are hundreds of genes. We now know that there are hundreds of genes expressed from the so-called inactive X chromosome. And these include X specific versions of the Y chromosomes broadly expressed global regulators. And putting these two new understandings together, we come to understand that at a basic cell by cell level, XY cells and XX cells are not, um, are not quite the same. And they, may, they differ in ways that we think are quite important. So stated differently, the old understanding, and apologies for the gendered bathroom door-like symbolisms here, stated differently, the old understanding was that whether one is XX or XY mattered only in the nether regions, only in the gonads whose sex hormone exports were thought to drive all biological sex differences across the body. Today, we begin to supplement this gonad-centric view of XX and XY biology with an understanding 
that the first X, XA, is shared between and does not differentiate the sexes. Instead, biological differences between females and males stem from the long neglected XI and Y chromosomes, which we now understand are active in every cell type of the body, including the gonads. So the scientific quest then, and it's a massive one, is to discover the molecular bridges that connect the human sex chromosomes, and specifically XI versus Y, that connect XI versus Y to sex differences in health and disease across the body. And I will assert that all biologically based differences, those not due to social or environmental uh, determinants, that all biological sex differences will trace their origins to the sex chromosomes. So the task then is to connect the 46th human chromosome, X, I, or Y, to sex differences across the breadth of human biology and medicine. And I would argue that the very first task, and one of special interest to female health, to women's health, is to understand the underestimated and far from inactive X, I. And with that, I would like to return and rededicate these comments to my hero, Mary Lyon, and, um, and thank you very much for um, giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts with you today. Thank you. Oh, what a terrific talk, David. That was amazing. Thank you so much for all of that. Um, I have a couple of questions. So in thinking about you know how important the differences are, but how so much research, scientific research is done in animal models. This is what I was thinking about when you were talking, whether it's flies or mice or monkeys um, or clinical trials or any, you know, all the way through. How, what, what recommendations, what would you like to see happen in scientific research to um, take some of these accounts take some of these differences into account, especially if you're talking about health and disease, drug development, that kind of thing? Well, Juliana, it's a fabulous question and one that I, I hope will take about three hours to answer. <laughs> because it has, there, there are so many dimensions to the question um, that you just asked and so many thoughts uh, begin to fly through my, my mind. So first of all, um, you point out that uh, from from the perspective of drug development, we have got to understand biological sex differences, not just in our own species, but in the species that we are all, that we rely upon for preclinical <laughs> research and even for safety and efficacy uh, testing of drugs and such. And I would say, just, just to be perfectly clear, um, we are beginning to understand, we're beginning to catalog sex differences in health and disease in our own species, we have no idea the degree to which the biological underpinnings of sex differences in our species are conserved to mouse, to dog, to rat. We have no idea. And I think it's, you know, I, to be honest, my hunch is that there will be considerably rapid evolution of sex differences and that it will be a confounding factor as we go forward. But we're going to have to ask those questions about which aspects, where are biological sex differences conserved and where are they diverged? And then we get into the whole realm of how do we get, how do we get full, how do we, how do we turn the attention of the biomedical research enterprise to these sex differences? <laughs> and how do we bring preclinical uh, science and how do we bring clinical science together in these respects? It might seem ironic, but I would say that clinical medicine is doing a better job of, of considering biological sex differences than preclinical research is today. <laughs> there are many fields of basic science um, <clears throat> that are conducted on laboratory animals that have very traditionally uh, studied only one sex or the other, and most typically male animals. 
um, just to call out a few fields, immunology, uh, neurobiology. Uh, in, in these fields, it has been um, a traditional practice to exclusively study male animals. Um, and, and then even if you study, if you study both sexes, you've got to break the data down and, mm -hmm. and break the data out <laughs> to, to, uh, you know, calculate the findings, share the findings, calculate them in both sexes separately. So there is enormous work to be done in, um, in both the preclinical, um, animal model studies as well as in, in, human, in human studies. I mean, one of the problems, you know, like I, I showed that, um, that heart failure study, <laughs> it was, it had not, it had not been in the original design of that heart failure study to separately analyze um, men and women. It was only in retrospect <laughs> um, that it became clear, oh my gosh, this, we might actually have a billion dollar drug on our hands for women, for women. And, and nothing of use for men. And, um, and so I'd actually, I, li I underscored the billion dollar nature <laughs> of that proposition to help provide motivation for, for the pharmaceutical industry to begin making those distinctions up front on a routine basis, because I think it may make the difference between enormous profits and none, um, right. even in those settings. But we could go on for two or three hours on this topic. So I'll, I'll let you jump back in, Julia. Thank you. Well, no, that was terrific. Um, yeah, that's so interesting. My, I have a question too, but I mean, we said that you had sequenced the Y chromosome 20 years ago. Yeah. And so I'm also wondering, I mean, there's been such an explosion in genomics and then multi-omics technologies. And yes. you're talking about chromosomes that are also heavily epigenetically modified. Yes. So now, you know, in the last 20 years or where we're sitting right now, how would you say that all of those new technologies are impacting the work that you're doing? And, you know, what are you looking forward to, you know, going forward being able to do? Well, so Juliana, great question. So to my mind, we, you know, we are, we are now dealing with um, increasingly accurate, complete and diverse reference sequences of the human genome, um, including increasingly diverse, accurate and um, uh, sequences um, from multiple individuals of the X and the Y chromosomes. But where I think the action is today is actually in the epigenetics <laughs> um, and in the multi-omics. So mm -hmm. we're having enormous, uh, an enormously uh, rich and rewarding time looking at the differences between the transcriptomes and the proteomes and the metabolomes of um, human um, XX and XY cells and tissues. So what I would say is that what we actually need to do to bring biological sex differences into sharp focus is to understand that not just our genomic DNA sequencing studies, but all of our epigenomic studies need to be done in parallel in males and females. Yeah. And so we are, we are just having the times of our lives <laughs> um, exploring um, the subtleties and the not so subtleties of um, male and female differences at the RNA level, at the protein level, at the metabolite level, and so on across tissues. Um, so, for instance, I mentioned the heart. We are doing a deep dive into the cardiomyocytes of males, of human males and females, and also of other species uh, because we're convinced. And we oh, and we now have preliminary results to suggest that there will be that there are important um, intrinsic differences between the cardiomyocytes of males and females. We're looking at immune cells, recognizing the um, profound differences in autoimmunity in autoimmune disease between males and females. Um, and so I think we're going to see um, multi-omics. 
differences between male and female cells all across the body. And we've got to catalog those. And we've got to catalog them not just in the disease states, but in the healthy states that presumably set the stage for sex-specific progression and development of disease. Mm. Okay, terrific. Yeah. Um, I, my last question is, um, you know, sex differences is something, I think of it a little bit, um, I would compare it to aging only in the sense that it's something that we all talk about and know about all the time, you know, mm -hmm. in society, everybody um, talks about these differences. And in some cases, not just sex differences, but also gender differences. Mm -hmm. And sure. I'm wondering where, you know, where does your research fit into the larger societal context of those differences? And what would your what would you want like your take home message to be in those conversations? Okay, so Juliana, I'm glad we have a fourth and a fifth hour to discuss all of this <laughs> because you've you've now just put on the table the issue of not just biological sex but also of gender, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, and of course, the the public discourse today is at least as much about gender as it is about biological sex, right? And what is the interplay of um, the public discourse around um, uh, gender and uh, issues of uh, gender identity and trans therapy and, all, and questions of that sort and the issues of biological sex that I'm naming? And frankly, I would say I'll even make it a little a little broader and bring it maybe back home to, uh, you know, it's interesting that the question of, of the framing of issues around women's health began to take shape um, about 30 years ago in the early 1990s. Um, <clears throat> we saw the creation of the Office of Research on Women's Health at the NIH. Uh, we saw the introduction of federal legislation that required the inclusion of women in NIH funded clinical trials. And so we, these, these questions, the questions we're talking about began to be framed in terms of women's health. I'm going to say on the issue on, on the, on the order of 30 plus years ago, um, so that's one stream of thought and one, one, one set of perspectives. Another set of perspectives uh, arises from the uh, very active public discourse around gender identity. And then I would say a, a somewhat third and related frame is the one that I've been introducing in, that I introduced in my comments, which is sex is a biological variable. And my hope and dream is that these three perspectives can be interwoven, <laughs> that they don't need to be. Um, it's not that one needs to take primacy or priority over the others, but these three rich strands of thought, one around gender identity, one around women's health, and a third around sex as a biological variable, that these can be interwoven and they need to speak to each other um, and so I see, I, I'm sort of thinking of a, you know, a three strand braided rope going forward. Um, and that's what I hope we can build. Amazing. Terrific. Thank you so much. This was so interesting. And um, thank you for the talk and for answering these questions. It was terrific to have you here. Juliana, thank you. And thank you to the society. Keep up the great work.